everyone. I am very excited to host Nate Holland, Director of Digital Innovation at NBBJ. I have been reading Nate's blog post for a while and seeing his uh, thought process and perspective in AEC is very, very uh, inspiring and unique. So really appreciate you coming on the show. Absolutely. Super glad to be here. Thank you. Awesome. So Nate, before we go deep dive, like out of any, everything you could do in life, why you chose architecture, technology, and what uh, a bit about your background, where you grew up? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think for a lot of people, architecture was like an obvious choice for me. Uh, I don't think I quite realized it until I got about halfway through high school, though. My uh, my dad's an architect. He owns a company here in Omaha, so I've been around it uh, my entire life. Uh, my mom's a professor in business, and who to thunk it, but I ended up with a uh, master's of business administration as well. Uh, again, not something I had planned out or seen, you know, growing up and going through high school. It just kind of all fell into place that I ended up being the perfect merger of my parents in a, in a very interesting way. Um, so from Nebraska, uh, currently live in Nebraska, um, went to school in Nebraska, surprise, surprise. Um, <laughs> and I really, yeah, my, my interests started out, uh, you know, just typical architecture, you know, wanted to design cool things. And uh, then I quickly found I had an aptitude for software and the ways that you can digitally create things. Uh, I think I learned seven or eight different platforms within the first three years of school because our teachers seemed to have a little bit of schizophrenia and every everyone demanded a different program right at the same time. And <laughs> Uh, somehow, some way, uh, Rhino ended up being the one that we stopped with when the when the carousel finished. And uh, moving into my grad school, uh, ended up sticking around at University of Nebraska again, and really focused in on computation and architecture. And my thesis um, was really around the combination of generative design and what humans are good at and interested in, uh, and what that relationship would look like moving forward. Um, saw Nate Miller, uh, who's the CEO of Proving Ground, when I was uh, presenting that at the Acadia Regional Conference. Uh, he was working at MBBJ at the time. He said, hey, you should come out here with us and ended up getting me a, getting me a spot up in Seattle where I was at for about 10 years. Um, and so yeah, I had a chance to work on a bunch of cool projects as a design computation lead, uh, ended up leading the design computation team and jumping into the uh, digital leadership team from wide. So I get a chance to actually look at a whole bunch of different groups and how we work with technology and workflows and all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, um, I don't know, maybe three years ago, there was this weird curveball thrown at me and they're like, hey, we want to give you a promotion. Uh, but it's not just in digital technology stuff, you need to also be an expert in human experience and measure human performance and how all those things come together. And um, I said, yeah, that sounds super exciting. So I'd been doing primarily geometry stuff, the uh, the Amazon Spears. I worked on a uh, really cool ceiling in uh, Two Union Square out in Seattle. Um, but they said, yeah, focus in on people. And I love people ish. I actually don't know. Sometimes I dislike people. Sometimes I really like uh, people. I like what makes people tick. I like thinking about the, the science behind it all and the way that we uh, come together and follow trends and, and all of those interesting things. Uh, so part of the design performance group at NBBJ now, uh, we look at everything from building performance to environmental performance and human performance is the the kind of side of it where I really uh, dive in and get super excited about um, looking at things like health, wellness, creativity. Um, yeah, all, all those kinds of things and how they how they come together and how our our clients can really do what they do better in a building that we that we design for them. That's so amazing. Like, I'm, I'm curious to know. So you have been in NBBJ for 10 years. So how has your perspective uh, when you were joining NBBJ about technology and in AC evolved with time versus now? 
Oh man, I don't want to give the answer away for all the people coming out of school, but uh, <laughs> I started out super optimistic that uh, technology would change the world, and now I'm a uh, somewhat jaded curmudgeon that uh, uh, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, it, I guess it would come back to uh, to people uh, in a lot of ways. Um, people make it uh, amazing, and people make it challenging. So <laughs> I think the uh, the skills that you learn in school, the skills that you develop around the technology and the passion, all those things absolutely are important, but, uh, but people, uh, people are really the key. Got it. Yeah. Like I was trying to know, like, what are some myths, uh, which or like some realistic, uh, expectations students should have when they're joining like a technical or a, a computational group. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, I think the myth is that professionals have it all figured out. Um, every uh, every <laughs> every group seems to struggle with uh, what is the what is next and what is our process and standardizing things. And as soon as you come up with a standard and start rolling out that standard, people change, and then there's something new that's awesome, and you want to go off and chase that and figure that out. Uh, and then all of a sudden, it's different than where you were. Um, so I think the fact that you know, this idea that professionals know what we're doing because we're professionals, we get it, we know the process, but the process is constantly evolving. And um, that may not be the case everywhere. Actually, some firms might be, you know, fall, falling back uh, because they're not evolving. But I think the, uh, the excitement is that continued chase of how do we do it better? What's new? What's exciting? And how do we uh, deliver a better um, tool, a better design, a better process, a better um, performance, any of those things that we're after. Mm -hmm. And uh, from your experience, uh, uh, like it, it takes a while to get like a standard application, like standard for Grasshopper or computational implementation across the whole firm. Like, so what are some tricks and uh, like which works out for you guys in terms of getting more people using the same computational design standard or onboarding on technological aspect? Um, I'm not sure if I, if I know the secret yet, but uh, one interesting nugget that someone shared with me the other day, and it's just been, it's been rattling around in my head for probably a couple months now, uh, but something along the lines of, you have to say something uh, enough times that you're actually sick of hearing yourself say it. And just at that moment when you think you can't possibly say it again, that's when the first person actually hears and understands what you're trying to get across. Um, and that's, you know, maybe it's an exaggeration, but it's an interesting one because yeah, architecture, people move. Like it's an industry where people are just constantly shifting between firms and uh, shifting within a firm, you know, it's one project is going and then all of a sudden that project splits off and those people are doing a million things with different project leaders and all that. So to really get a message across, you really, really have to uh, communicate. And that is, that's probably the, the biggest thing that you can, can focus on. And then I would say it, it never hurts to inspire people and give people runway to try something they're passionate about. If you can, if you can get somebody excited about an idea, give them the things they need to, to go off and find that success on their own make sure you know you're mentoring you're supporting uh those are the areas where where you really see major jumps in capabilities you know you can do a firm-wide training where you spend an hour at lunch and you show oh here's all of the ways that you can do x y and z and grasshopper and nobody walks away really that much further ahead whereas you inspire one person they say they want to try something on a project you invest you know 20 hours over the course of a couple weeks helping them solve problems, helping them fix bugs, moving them forward. That's, those are the people who really find a calling and, and actually move up and, and do really amazing things. That's great. Like, so apart from technical hurdle, if one can overcome, over, overcome the motivation part, like people are gonna like go on their own to learn things in this direction. Yeah, technology is the easy part. <laughs> um, maybe that's another myth is that, uh, that tools and technology were the, were the hard part when you learned them in school. No, it's the, it, like I said at the beginning, it's the people, um, everywhere from 
colleagues to clients to bosses to interns to everybody every person is different and has different motivations and different uh desires and strategies and blah 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 and that is yeah that's that's where the success of the make or break happens within an organization is in the people i see since we are talking about people like are there any like tools or approaches for coordination and communication with people uh, which uh, are worked out well mm, that's an interesting one um hmm how many you met you may have stumped me um i think that organization is a key part of building trust and i think trust is a big big aspect of that so what i mean by organization is uh, when you have a meeting take notes on it when you have action items for a meeting get your stuff done and then you know you've got a something like asana or something like Pla planner or tasks or trello or whichever one you're you're on uh, where you have all the different tasks and everybody knows what's expected of them. You've sent out the uh, uh, minutes or whatever you want to call it from the from the meeting and everybody knows what happened. They know what's going on. You've set up the next meeting. Everybody knows when it has to be done by. Um, I find that just those little things, just doing the basics of business right is a uh, it's a trust builder. People respect the process. They see, yes, there's rigor, there's purpose. It's going to continue. Um, you know, you don't have to be uh, overly demanding to to get it done. You know, you be understanding of deadlines, be understanding of all those things. But yes, I think uh, OneNote is is awesome for those things. I think that um, Asana is the one that I prefer to use, but we're uh, Microsoft, so we've got uh, uh, Planner and Tasks and all those kinds of things. So we end up going that route most of the time. Uh, sometimes we go GitHub, and GitHub's got the the Kanban boards and all those kinds of things in there. Uh, I just love, I love that kind of organization and seeing the the group come together and uh, and collaborate on that timeline. I think that's that's really exciting to see. I see. And before is that your question, on, or did I go off on a tangent? Yeah, no, no you answered it pretty well. <laughs> I was just thinking when you said about trust and like recently, like I, I'm exploring blockchain for coordination, communication, DAOs, and like trust in those aspects. I'm wondering like, uh, are you guys uh, exploring on like using any blockchain stuff in uh, or experimenting in that space? Uh, I wish, but no. <laughs> um, I, I think again, um, you just have to find somebody who's, it's not commonplace enough that you can say that, yes, this is where we strategically want to go because you don't quite understand what it's going to be yet. Uh, it's one of those things where if you have somebody on the team who's passionate about it, uh, they just do cool stuff with it. I know you're one of those people. I've seen a lot of your posts and the, the uh, reposts that you find on the topic, but we don't have anybody who's currently uh, geeking out over that kind of stuff right now. So no, we're not, uh, we're not really pushing that area. Got it. I think this is a great time to do some deep dive into tech developments. All right, uh, so tech developments. So we've got a uh, ton of stuff going on. I can't share all of it, but I've tried to think through a thread of ideas about what is important in the tools that we build. Um, so I think there's a, two categories of tools. There's the I'm designing or I'm doing something on a project team and I know there's a better way and I want to build something that's flexible and can enable me to do something I couldn't do otherwise. So I think that happens all the time across most of our projects in the firm. We've got highly skilled people, um, we've got leaders in design computation, so we make sure that all that stuff kind of touches all the projects that it needs to. Um, there's the second part of it, which I think is really the, the exciting high, high value piece, and that is using technology to inform decisions. Uh, and again, I can break that into two chunks. One of it is the analysis where you try to figure out what a process is. You do the math behind it and you come up with a, a number or a color gradient in some way that is visually clear which scheme outperforms another scheme or where certain benefits might be within a scheme. But there's another part that I'm going to actually focus on, and that is um, 
presenting real time data, presenting real time design choices to inform decision making based on what's happening. And that's, I know a lot of people are talking about it, but I think that really is, um, is super important. And I think NBBJ actually was a little bit ahead on this. Uh, if you remember way back when, uh, when Andrew Human was actually here, uh, he worked on the Human UI plugin. Mark Seep was a part of that. I helped with a few very, very small pieces. And that was a monumental step forward for Grasshopper because all of a sudden we had an interface hides all the, the ugliness of Grasshopper and it can actually look beautiful and it can be something you can put in front of a client. And that was a, that was a shift for us. Um, so that's kind of the beginnings of some of these ideas. Maybe not the beginning, but it's towards the beginning. So I'm going to jump into a tool. Um, let's see, share some screen. Um, that again is is a human UI interface. Um, and apologies for the resolution of some of this stuff. I had a different uh, different screen resolution going on beforehand. Um, but the idea here is that you create a, a series of dashboards. And these dashboards have inputs, the dashboards have outputs, and you come up with something that's in the middle. So this tool is actually is not really doing anything super complicated design-wise. It's actually a glorified Excel spreadsheet. Uh, so this is one that we did recently for Pursuit, but we've done this on project after project after project. I can't tell you how many iterations of this this tool there have been, but each one is slightly better graphically. It's uh, slightly different uh, key units. Uh, but the basic idea is that you have a um, number of square feet per um, key project unit. Uh, so you could change how many of these, how many square feet you have per OR. And you can see that there's a little bit of space emptying up in the building. So you could say, let's see, what if we did a little bit more uh, public space in the building and you can see how that starts to be oh we're too full now we're not full and you can see that just the program adds up quick it's intuitive and then you get to this panel over to the right where you start to plug in some assumptions about uh, cost per square foot of these different pieces you talk about the site you talk about other costs and you have numbers you have things that you can talk about in a meeting clients respond very very well to this because they can say oh, well, this isn't the assumption I would have made. And you say, oh, well, we'll just change that. You don't have to go back and wait a couple of weeks and then come back. You just do that right in the meeting. Uh, and it really helps drive uh, decisions with them. So I think that's one of the, uh, the first piece I wanted to show. I think that's a really uh, relatively simple tool, but super, super effective. It's amazing. And um... So, for example, anyone can uh, select a geometry tribe shape and experiment with this tool and uh, all the intelligence has been encoded in the assumptions for cost calculation program uh, manipulation. Yeah, so it's a we, we've kind of struck a hybrid on this between being super reusable and being uh, from scratch in that every project seems to have different program every project has different values sometimes it's the the total square feet sometimes it's the key units sometimes they want to do gross sometimes they want to do net and you have, just have to change things around so really the core of it is just doing a bunch of math and doing the um this little stacking diagram here in the middle and then yeah just rearranging the different pieces on the ui we also keep it in the hands of people who are comfortable and familiar uh, we've we've talked about do we try to put something like this on the web and allow clients to play with it and stream it, and there's there's just too many too many issues with that from a um, well what if they come up with something and then they say you should build this and it's like well that doesn't really work uh, so we we try to keep it something where we're in the room we're running this with them we're providing professional advice on where the the settings are, but we're also making sure we're clicking the button so nobody gets frustrated and those kinds of things. Um, but usually this is run live mm -hmm. with them. That's great. And uh, one more question. So uh, are there like people from computational team like uh, involved when they're presenting with clients or the project manager or the client coordination person in the firm is generally using this tool? 
Yeah, usually there's somebody from the design computation team is um, is in the meeting and is running it. Um, if there just happens to be a computational guru on the team who's not part of the design computation leadership group, then they sometimes will run with it. But normally it's someone from the from the computation team. Got. Um, should I jump into the next one? Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. So this next one is a uh, is a fun one. It's a little bit old now, but I just I love the story that came from it. Um, so this is a study. This is downtown Bellevue, which is a city just across the lake from Seattle. And uh, what we're looking at is an up zone of this giant um, part right across the interstate from downtown Bellevue. So you can see how big downtown Bellevue is. And this area right across the interstate really is almost the same size as the downtown. So it's really a huge opportunity for, for what could this be and what's the, uh, what's the new process here. And so we built one of these interactive massing tools. I, I assume most of the audience has seen these types of things where you, uh, you build an interface, you come up with some rules, you have parcels, and the parcels kind of do a little wedding cake stack, or maybe you get a little bit fancier with the form of your buildings. Uh, but the goal of it is you have uh, a certain series of blocks and networks, and you then can see what is the, the size of building. You can start to pull out what is the area of each one of these different use types within the space. And I think most, most firms have either done this or seen this. I actually wouldn't do this in Grasshopper at all if I was going to do it today. I think uh, Esri's Urban Platform does this just like right out of the box now, which is fantastic. Uh, but he, here's the key trick that made it fun for us. We did this with a group of citizens of that neighborhood. Uh, so people who lived and worked there, uh, a group of them came in as part of an advisory council, and we had them, uh, they were helping to design. We were the consultant for that group. And what we ended up coming up with was this process where we printed out these little eight and a half by 11s, and we gave them a uh, kind of a rough diagram of where the neighborhood was. And we said, see these little building sections down in the bottom. These big ones, these are tall ones that are the size of downtown buildings. These are ones that are size of houses, and this is kind of everything in between. Color in the box below it with a crayon, and then color in a section of the, of the site plan with that crayon, and that's going to be that size. And so we had all the members of the room do that, said, doesn't matter which box you color, doesn't matter what color you put in it, just be consistent. And we did this, you know, we had uh, the whole room full of people do it, and then we had a... Uh, a second set of property owners in that area do the same thing. And then we actually did it in one of our studio crits. So we also had a bunch of designers do the same thing. And once we had all of these things done in crayon, we uh, took a picture of each one. And, and sometimes we used a scanner, sometimes we used a phone. Uh, but we then put them into Photoshop, pulled off all of the, uh, the RGB values for every pixel. And we were able to um, align all of those and start to pull data from where the different pixel values were associated with each building uh, building size. So we came up with a series of these graphs where you can see the darker the color is, the more people that chose that particular size in that area. And so you're able to say, oh, well, this is an area of consensus. Most people chose this. Uh, or the end of this is an area of contention because there's a little bit of all of the different pieces shown in there. But now that we have it in this format, it's just data. And so now you can start to look at all sorts of things with the data, which are really fun. Uh, we can start to look at mean, median, and mode uh, across the different pieces. We're able to start to compare different groups. Uh, so for example, the property owners, you can see they everybody roughly followed the same idea. But the property owners have a lot more of purple, which means they get to build the super tall buildings, which means their property is worth a lot more money. Uh, obviously, makes a little bit of sense. On the other side, you have the citizens. They kind of went a little bit more in the middle. They were a bit more vanilla uh, with what they were expecting. And then you had the uh, the architecture group do a crit. And of course, we did the the widest spectrum. And we wanted to get into all sorts of levels of detail from the, the super low density up to the high rise uh, across the site. Uh, but I showed you that tool at the beginning. What we did was we used those that data as the input for this tool. So I'm going to pull this one up on the side here. 
and I'm hoping you can kind of mentally rotate it, but you can see the uh, this area of blue is this area of blue. You can see the green kind of working its way up and around. Um, you see some of these yellows in here starting to become these ones and then down around this little section through here. So it was a very interesting process where we went from crayon markings on a printout to super useful data that we could compare and contrast different groups to then driving a 3D model, which meant that we had all of the data. So because we had these sketches, we got this piece, which meant we got the 3D model, which meant we knew exactly how many square feet of office were in the area, how many square feet of residential, uh, commercial, or uh, retail, and those kinds of things. And the, the first go around, we had everybody doing it um, on paper. And then the second time we talked about this live in a group interaction with them, then we broke into two teams. And then we were able to then have those two teams make adjustments live. And we were running it uh, on our computer that time as opposed to the CRAN method. But they were um, talking about it sketching it on a paper. We were then just kind of drawing the poly lines on the computer and boom, we were able to have all of the data ready of the two schemes that came out of it before they rearranged the chairs back into the, uh, the meeting table configuration. Uh, so it's a really fun process to, again, get back to that human interaction. How do you get more people engaged in the design process uh, really quickly to understand those implications? That's incredible. I, I love like the whole process and it's very uh, intuitive and like playfulness uh, aspect of more community members participating it and the workflow which you automated from scanning that, getting the data and having, I'm assuming a generative algorithm which gets like the density data and populating volumes uh, in the 3D environment. Yeah, so it was, pretty much a, um, it was a rule driven work throw. We weren't doing anything super smart with, um, you know, machine learning or any of that kind of stuff. It was just very simple uh, rule-based offsets of if the building of this shape fit, go with this one. If a building of that shape didn't, then try this one and um, add a little bit of random variation in there. Um, but yeah, it was super, super effective at getting people to comprehend the impact of things that they were deciding. Um, yeah, that, that's really the goal is to drive those decisions. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering like when people gave uh, their ideas on 2D level and when, uh, when after seeing the end result in a spatial 3D level, were the opinions changed, remained same or, and also, yeah. How do you guys coordinate this in COVID? Uh, so this was pre-COVID. This, like I said, this one is this one's older. I want to say this one's maybe 2017, 2018. Um, yeah, I think 2018 uh, was when we finished this project, and so um, everybody was in person. Uh, we didn't talk about individual schemes. We never called out one person and talked about theirs uh, separately from the rest. It was always a, um, a consensus building exercise. So we talked about the majority of people wanted this. Can somebody who um, who just who wanted this talk about why? And then, oh, there are a few people who didn't think this. Can you guys stand up and talk about why? And then the group kind of worked through and came to a consensus. And again, lots of opinions as any public process uh, does. But it was. It, was extremely helpful for helping to build consensus uh, within only a couple meetings. Got it. And if you were to design a participatory or a consensus tool right now, what tech stack would you approach or what's the workflow? That's a good question. Um, our, our process of scanning the documents and pulling out RGB values per pixel and then scaling that down, I think that's, um, that was pretty rudimentary at the time. So I bet there's, um, I haven't really done many tools with that, but I think some of the, um, there's a few online tools for helping to analyze uh, images a lot more effectively now. I haven't uh, dug into those, but I'd look at some of the, the pre-processing tools that you would run before doing some of those um, machine learning algorithms. And then as far as where to, to build the rule base, um, uh, Esri's urban platform and city engine are, this is really what they're 
they're meant to do is large scale planning efforts, uh, kind of generative city cityscapes, and even going as far as to doing uh, digital twins of cities is really within the realm of those platforms. Um, I don't use them, but I, I've seen enough uh, about them that I would say that's that's where I'd push a team to explore next. Got it. And I'm wondering, like, uh, as in your role for design innovation, for any particular new idea or tool development, how do you make decisions whether should we develop this tool from scratch? Should we integrate into existing services? Should we adopt some <laughs> third-party services? Like, uh, Man, that that's, yeah, that's that's one of the hardest choices because we've got a firm of. 800 plus people were big. We're not the biggest by any stretch of the imagination, but across that size of a firm, everybody wants to work a little differently. Each mm -hmm. of our offices has a different personality in a way, uh, just because people are separated from each other and you just don't see the things as, quite as uh, uh, readily every day. And so, yeah, when it comes down to, is this something we're going to develop uh, or something we're going to buy, it's a lot lot of uh, user group meetings. It's a little bit of prototyping and case studies. Uh, so if it's something we're going to to buy, we try to get a bunch of teams to to use that software first, you know, little pilots. And if they do use it, uh, that's that's data. We know somebody's at least found enough value to continue using it. If they use it and then ask to use it again on their next project, that's data. Um, and then if they use it and it's obvious that there's something of high value, we, we can take a look at that as well. So it's a matter of being somewhat rigorous about who gets to test things when there's a use case for it and, and blah, blah, blah. When it comes to developing something, it's a, it's a similar process. Although again, one of those things that I've learned having been at this for, for a while now, it's a, seemingly a decade, um, is that tools that come directly out of project asks, you know, I have a client that needs this and there seems to be enough value that we should put some time towards making a thing for that one client. Um, those are the things that are actually going to become the most popular. When you put down a bunch of um, computational people in a room and say, what do project teams need? How should they work? Uh, those tools tend to fall a little bit flat. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, you keep working through the process and you can improve them, you can develop them, you can get them used. Uh, but really it's, again, like that one that I shared earlier, uh, the stacking tool, a team needed that for a project. So a uh, computation leader built a version of that. It was super crude, just way, way, way um, different than what we saw, but another team asked for it. And then another team asked for it. And now we keep getting those requests. And that's, those are the tools that, uh, that really take off is when they just have enough uh, continual efforts to, to build them. So if in this case, there was an option to buy something or build something, it comes down to who's available. Um, you know, Building something of a larger flow like this probably isn't someone fresh out of school. Uh, but it also requires a significant amount of time. So it's not going to be someone who's split between 15 different projects either. Um, and if you're going to buy something, then you have to do training and rollout and deployment. There's there's some pretty significant uh, investment there as well. And it's just a matter of, are you going to use that tool on another project? And yeah, but that's... Yeah, and I also feel like building a tool has a lot of other things like you need a product guy, you need like there's a technical depth where like things are constantly changing. How do you keep up to date? And uh, if there are bugs, fix it or if there are library updates. Yeah, another reason that building it on a project, you know, if that person is actually embedded on the project, they have all of the incentive in the world to keep the tool up to date, to keep it working, to keep you know, they can actually stop and fix it. They're not on another deadline and having to pull away from that deadline to fix a bug kind of thing. So, yeah. Interesting. Um, yep. Um, well, I've got a couple other ones. Um, so this next one, I'm just going to share a little video of. And what is... Oops. 
little inception going on there again. Um, <laughs> so this is one where um, this is a super weird uh, project case, but uh, we had an owner and the owner was going to hire us for something. And we said, we can actually build a tool to do this. And the owner said, well, can I just have the tool? And we said, well, no, that doesn't really work. And they're like, yeah, well, why don't you just give us the tool? And so we, we said, okay, well, we're going to build this in Grasshopper because you're not giving us the, the dollars to build it in, in something more robust. That means you're going to have to get Rhino. You're going to have to, it. yeah, 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 just tell us what we have to do. Uh, so we ended up building this tool for them, a uh, super specific use case for a very specific client, a uh, large institution out kind of on their own property. Uh, the client wanted to be able to say, what does it mean if I put a property here? Uh, what are the cut and fill implications of that? What are the utility connection implications and what does that mean for cost? And it's like, well, yeah, we can build this and we'll just have to do some tutorials on how to teach your guys to use Rhino. We're going to have to do some instructional videos on how to install all of this and get all the plugins put together. And they said, yeah, let's do it. Um, so I got to work with a guy out of our uh, New York office to, to put this together. Let's get past the, the grasshopper loading. So again, human UI, creating these interfaces so that they can work with that as opposed to to Grasshopper, but we're starting to get a little bit more uh, fancy and interactive. I've got this playing way too fast. Oh, that's half speed already. <laughs> a fun time. I'll just scroll through it here. So you click, uh, you add a building to the site, and this thing just pops on the site. Uh, what you're seeing in red is the area where, where land is having to be cut away, and what's in green is where it has to be filled. Uh, the darker the quant, the color, the the higher the quantity. Uh, and so you click a button in the interface, it drops uh, a rectangle into the, to the Rhino environment. Uh, you're able to use the gumball to, to move it, to stretch it. Um, and it's updating all this kind of as you go, all the numbers. Again, that's kind of the, the point of this is to give you real-time number feedback. Uh, so you say, okay, well, I want to change where the parking's at. And again, it's a tool that we had to build so we can't have infinite options for how they do parking. Uh, so we said, well, you'll get a building and you'll get to put it on any of the corners is where you can put your loading dock uh, in this particular case. Um, Nate, so you, yeah. Is it, is it possible to do full screen? It sure is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm seeing it on a giant monitor. I apologize. Um, yeah. Thank uh, you. Nonetheless, um, so you put the building on, you, uh, Move the loading dock. Of course, you can change the number of floors. It's a 2D tool, so you can see the cost changing, but the plan looks about the same. Uh, you do a little bit more finessing, and now you can see we're dropping in a parking lot. Uh, so when you drop in the parking, parking also wants to be relatively flat, so you're getting a little bit of cut and fill. Uh, the client was also concerned about how far away is the parking. Uh, so we do this little dashed line that tells them in, in feet how far away is it. Um, we have no idea where the building entry is at this point in time. We have no idea how you're getting to the parking lot, but nonetheless, we know the distance between the two, so we can tell that to the client. Um, you can start to rearrange it. You can start to adjust the, uh, the cost values, because again, they've got their own contractors and they've got their own whole set of uh, dollar values and what things charge um, for this institution, so they can plug all that in. And then as far as utilities, uh, you know, we just give them an option to, to draw a series of polylines. So they don't have to worry about Rhino layers. They're not doing any of that. They just hit this draw connection button and it gives them a chance to, to draw the line in Rhino. Uh, we take care of all the, the metadata behind it and they can kind of continue to hit this draw connection button until they figure out what the length of all their utilities are. And of course, every foot of utility has a, a dollar amount to it. So they're again getting all of this information uh, up to speed. You can choose, you know, change your background, see all the, the different pieces that way. Um, and then of course you can um, save, save different options. You can uh, compare different options that way. And you can see at the bottom, we had to plug in a whole legal description of all of the different um, assumptions that we made because this is a super high level conceptual tool. Uh, but nonetheless, it's one that the, the client was super excited about. And yeah, 
that's that's what we delivered for him. Interesting. So kind of a unique case, but I thought it would be fun to share what we were up to. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you see adoption of this tool across other projects? And like, what are the challenges uh, in terms of scalability you have seen? Yeah, so this was not intended to be used on multiple projects across the firm. Um, the the client wanted a tool. He paid for us to develop the tool. He got the tool. Um, everybody got paid and everybody was happy. Um, as far as what we can pull out of this to use, I think the uh, some of the cut fill stuff um, was kind of an interesting one. We hadn't really explored that from a grasshopper perspective. But uh, yeah, we, we developed some interesting workflows with, uh, with meshes. I think the plugin was uh, DocaFosser. Some, I can't remember exactly how you pronounce it or what it was, but something like that. And that was a new, a new piece we learned. Um, we got into a little bit more of the, uh, the user interface kind of stuff with um, human UI and being able to just draw polylines by clicking a button in human UI. That was something we learned that other projects will now be able to do uh, more effectively. Interesting. Can you give some tips or advice how to convince client to to fund to develop a tool or how to negotiate? <laughs> uh, that's an interesting one. Um, talk about tools in your um, in your pitch in the in the RFP. If they give you um, you know a chance to interview, whatever it is, if you demonstrate that you have tools, all of a sudden they're like oh, well, I want a tool like that, build me a tool. And then it doesn't really matter what your project manager says you have time to do or not to do. If the, uh, if the client says, you showed me you can build a tool, I want you to build me a tool. Uh, now, you're, now you're in the land of what is the tool we're going to build, not do I have hours to build a tool. Got it. And, so, uh, yeah, and, and clients love it. They, they really are excited when you... Um, you know, ev there's an app for everything. There's a website for everything. People are just used to having interactive tools. And when you say, well, we're going to do a, a design process and we'll show up today and we'll do some sketches and then we'll show up uh, a couple of weeks later and we'll do a walkthrough of the model, the clients, they want that ability to to interact and they want something a bit more custom. So they're, they're looking for that. Got it. And uh, do you like do all the tools development in-house or do you like... Uh, sub out some of this course to like software engineer or freelancing folks? Uh, we don't. Uh, we don't. We do it all in house. Uh, we have uh, a lot of grasshopper experts, and at any time, any given time, we usually have a handful who can uh, write custom Python, C sharp web development kind of stuff. And then we have some um, Revit plugin developer. Uh, in our Columbus office, and we have a few uh, few web developers uh, in the firm as well. So there there tends to be just enough capabilities. You know, sometimes it flexes as to what uh, what you can develop in or what their capabilities are, but there always is just enough. Got it. Awesome. <clears throat> um, so rattling on with the uh, with the same kind of theme here. Um, building stuff for clients uh, to use and to play with. Uh, deploying a Grasshopper script, I don't recommend. I don't think it's worth trying to convince them to download Rhino, trying to convince them to install Grasshopper and all the plugins and all the stuff that that we all go through and know by heart. It's, it's quite challenging for somebody else to do. Uh, so if you can build a web app, that's cool. Uh, but Power BI is actually a really nice in-between. Um, Again, Proving Ground has some really cool stuff. Uh, they've been doing, I think, Tracer and Semantic. They go from Revit and Rhino, and you can actually start to get some 3D model stuff in there. Um, but I would also say that it doesn't need to be that complicated. Um, clients respond to really simple tools, and the ability to move a slider and see the outputs change somehow just makes all the difference in the world. It's hard to say why it's different than entering it into a spreadsheet, but somehow when it's graphic and it's in a web tool, their eyes light up. And that is when you win projects. That is when you get repeat work and all those good things. 
Uh, so this is one that uh, Melissa Alexander out of our Seattle uh, consulting studio did. This is a surgical forecasting tool. Uh, so it's a, it's a table of all of the different service lines, all of the different uh, expectations. You click on tool information, and of course it pops up this nice little window. Uh, and because this is in Power BI, you can deploy this on our consulting website. We have a number of these tools there just as kind of teasers for clients to, uh, to get excited about what we do. Um, but you can click on the, the forecast parameters. It brings up a number of assumptions. And uh, just like with <coughs> any number of our tools, you can kind of just game it out. So if this utilization goes up to 75%, you can see all of my numbers and graphs, and you can see the total ORs required. Um, this is the, the turnaround time in between operation rooms. So right now, if it's five minutes, and it's one thing, but if you just increase that to 10 minutes, so it takes them twice as long to clean it, uh, you can see the total numbers of ORs just jumped up. And ORs are exceedingly expensive. Uh, so a client sees that, now all of a sudden, now they're making that connection between, oh, you mean if I can just shave one minute off, I can save how many dollars and having to have this extra OR room that's really not necessary. Uh, so there's all sorts of very interesting things that come out of uh, these com conversations, everything from operations to how much uh, building do you have to build. Uh, in the consulting studio, it's a very interesting win when the, the result is you guys actually don't need any new space. You just need to change the way you work because uh, obviously we don't get to do the architecture project. But we get a very happy client at the end of the day, so it's kind of a funny uh, funny action uh, there. So numbers and graphs do it for some people. Other people like to see it in different ways. So of course you can create these uh, different little graphs and charts and you could come in here and again, do a very similar uh, change. Uh, you can see now we need more ORs or you could change your growth assumptions over time. And again, it would tells you what you need in the future. And then you create just a variety of different tabs that have all sorts of things from utilization to to growth. And we've we've made any number of these uh, these Power BI websites, and they're generally they're pretty light, they're pretty fast, and uh, they go really well. Like one thing I really like, uh, like in all the tools you're developing, like uh, you really are like knowing the problem space of client really well like even if one changes is impacting like their client decision making like it's they're going to use it they're going to like it so it's great uh, in all of the approach I, i'm curious to know uh so like you you showed projects of integrating human ui you show you're showing now power bi so uh not a lot of firms have like uh fund for r d or tech development but like these are like some a low hanging tech integration, which they can integrate and make like a good UI experience or user Absolutely. Interaction. Yeah, it's a it's a huge lift to go to a uh, to a different platform. If we have time, I'll show you a, a web tool that uh, that we just developed and released internally. Um, but it the amount of effort to to create the graphic style and all of those interactions is just very very different. Uh, from putting together something in Power BI or using Human UI, I think those are uh, two tools that we should really be uh, jumping on uh, as architects, as computational designers. There's so much, so much just is built in. You can just do things easily. Uh, you don't have to build it from the ground up. That's awesome. I was about to ask: Are there any such tools which we should keep an eye on? Um, so this is not what this is not released publicly yet. Um, I say yet in there because I think everybody has ambitions of getting it public. But uh, currently, we just wrapped it up. Uh, I shouldn't say we because I didn't actually do uh, anything on this. There's an entire team of people that worked on it, but um, nonetheless, this is our tool called Zero Guide. It's a uh, it's a tool for um, very very early on in a project trying to figure out how do you get to net zero carbon. <clears throat> so something like um, Tally or one-click LCA, 
you run those later in a project when you know materials, you know how much stuff you have, you can then assign an embodied carbon value to it. Um, oh shoot, where's my video on this one? Uh-oh, I have to pull it up real quick. I meant to have that open before we started. You can cut this part out, right? It's a live stream, but okay. It's a it's live fine. stream, what do you do? Um, <laughs> Nope. All right. Well, that's always fun if you can't find it uh, when you're live. Um, so let's just click through the tool. And uh, I don't know if we'll be able to get through all the end of it because it's a little bit uh, slow. So you you put in your, your name, your email, you find your projects. Uh, you get a chance to uh, pick where your pro project is at. It pulls in stuff, you tell it what year it's moving in. Uh, you get to enter a whole bunch of information. So let's say we have a 40,000 square foot site and we've got a uh, college university with 120,000 square feet above grade and an extra 60,000 square feet below grade. Uh, and already you can start to see, you know, the percentage breakdown, you're starting to see numbers pop up on the side. You can add some parking. Um, so you could say we've got a uh, 40,000 square foot lot of parking. You go next. You say what you're, you're going for. Uh, we're going to be a gold project. And you, uh, well, of course, it wants me to click through all these different things. There we go. Next. Um, so then you can start getting into things. So you can start taking a look at your embodied carbon, your operational carbon, transportation, path to zero. Uh, so I don't think I need to walk you guys through the entire tool, uh, but it's essentially a, a fancy uh, type of survey in a lot of ways. And that it it's asking you high level questions and it's starting to give you high level results. Um, this tool is not, 3D. Uh, it's again, it's they ask you a question, and based on questions, it flows into a formula. Um, but it's all live and interactive. So, is your building single or multiple buildings? If I choose multiple, you can see my carbon just went up. That means you've got two facades, you've got two cores, you've got extra stairs. Uh, versus if I just say it's single, this is relying on rules of thumb. It's relying on kind of average calculations and those kinds of things to, to get there. Uh, but it's super useful and adds a lot of, uh, of very good information about your building. Did you know that if you had the same size project and it was less than 85 feet or more than 240 feet, you know, there's a huge difference in the amount of carbon? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but this tool helps designers to kind of uncover that and to set good baselines for, uh, for a project type. So um, again, I mentioned this is an internal tool. We're still working through all of the kind of edge conditions because obviously it worked through the testing, but what does it mean for, for people to actually use the tool? Do, does the data make sense? Do the outcomes that come from this actually improve design, I think is another big question that we have to ask of, we have a tool, but if the designs aren't improving, has the tool provided us much value? Uh, so yeah, um, what does it mean to, to develop a tool like that? I would say the you have to have the, the tech stack. I mean, that's, that's a huge portion of it. Uh, we've got a uh, Peter Matev. Uh, he's at Enscape now, was at NBBJ when we kicked off the project. Absolutely brilliant, super fun guy. Um, he helped kind of architect the whole thing out, figure out where we go. Uh, and then we got a guy, Joseph O'Neill, in our Columbus office who just, he gets all the pieces of it. He's a, he's a web developer. He's front end. He's back end. He's, he really is what it means to be full stack and uh, can really jump into anything. Um, and other people, Nathan, Nathan Chan and Pragya, Pragya Gupta, have both made huge um, impact on it, but that's from the tech side. All these things I mentioned were rules of thumb, were simple calculations. That means you need an enormous body of knowledge pouring into it. And so uh, Peter Alspach from our design performance group 
uh, Laura, a number of others, all kind of helped figure out that side of things. And then there's the, the graphic side of it. So we actually have a graphic designer, UI, UX person who was making all of the little animations, do, you know, figuring out exactly what the hover over effect should be. And that is, that's why that kind of tool takes longer to develop than a human UI tool. But it looks better in the end. It's higher quality. It's something that you can deploy. It's something that has uh, a different level of polish. And I think there's a lot of value to that. Um, a guy I used to work with, um, he, he made a comment once that if you wanted to build a tool for yourself to use, you know, say that's X, if you wanted to build a tool that you could reuse, it's 10 times the effort. And if you wanted to build a tool that somebody else could use, now it's 100X the effort. If you want to build something that you can deploy internally, it's 1,000. And if you want to do something that's deployed to the world or that you actually sell for money, you're now up to 10,000. You just add a zero uh, to the amount of effort uh, when you uh, increase the number of people using it, increase the, the purpose of it. But again, there are times when that's the right choice, and there are times when you just want to go the simple route. And you have to kind of find your own path there. Got it. This is quite insightful. And I was trying to like get a bigger picture of like, uh, the developments in like architecture tech firm is a lot of tools being developed are in the early stage, which wants to get inside about the later stage analysis, be it the construction cost integration, be it the sustainability, carbon calculation, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, communication or generative design tools, which help in planning. So uh, I'm curious. Like, I think there's a reason for that. There's a uh... The ability to impact change without impacting cost is just much, much higher at the beginning of the project. And so the, the value to the overall project is really, really condensed into that beginning part of a project. But the you know, architecture, most of our hours are in the later part of a project, but really the impact isn't near as great. So we could save ourselves time, but a client doesn't necessarily care about saving a few hundred architect hours when they could change the the lifetime embodied carbon of their building or the um, the cost of their their cooling equipment kind of thing. There's just much bigger numbers than the later stages of architectural design. So I think that's why you see such a push for for early stage tools. Got it. Yeah, even in at Perkins and Will, uh, I see those development and across other architecture firms, a lot of focus, like a lot of. Uh, tools being developed in early stage and I see external third party developments as well. So uh, I'm just trying to understand is is the third party development not working well or every firm has their own source in the in their own generative design tool which requires them to build. Every firm thinks they have their own generative source. Um, <laughs> I would suggest that no, the, the stuff that we're doing is not that different than the stuff Perkins and Will is doing. I would say the way we integrate it into our design process, I hope we do a better job because I hope we win more projects. But uh, I would say, you know, the tools, the workflows, the way you actually put together a script, the capabilities are probably not that different. It's It's what you do with it. It's what what is a project 10 years after it's built? What is the quality of that project, the, the energy, the performance, how do people feel when they're going in there? That's what really matters. And how you get there is, is a process, but what you need to do is make sure that the stuff you're doing today, the tools you're building, makes that 10 years down the road uh, the best that it can be, because that building's got to stand for another, uh, another 30 to 40 years after that point. And how do you develop the intuition where like uh, developing a tool which makes an impact or which is more like uh, adoptable by the whole company? Because do you need to present be like have more conversation with clients and their needs or like you stay involved in projects more? Like Talk to as many people as you can. <laughs> I think that there's no there's no one size fits all answer to that. But I would say that uh, Communication is key. Uh, the more people that you're talking to, that you're sharing value with, that you're 
um, demonstrating your abilities with and the more the more you're listening to. So, I mean, it's partly showing what's possible, but then the other part is listening to what are the pain points? What are the opportunities? What are people talking about? Um, and just being aware of that and then connecting the dots. Connecting the dots is not something that happens, you know, when you just sit down and say, okay, what tool am I going to build today? It happens over a long period of time, like, oh, I've got this idea. I've got this idea. I've got this idea. Okay, now I've got five minutes. I'm going to try that idea. Um, so I think that's where that's where it's at is just making sure that you're always have a learning mindset, even when it's going into a meeting, try to learn something from everybody that you talk to, because everybody has useful insight and perspectives in different ways. Got it. And I'm going to wrap up the interview with a few or more questions. So okay. if you had unlimited time and resources, what are some tools or initiative you would like to do? Interesting. Um, well, personally, I really want to jump into Hypar. Uh, I haven't made the made the leap yet. I've watched other people do it. I've you know we've sent people to to workshops on it, but I I got to get my hands on that one of these days and and really get get through it. Um, I would say that um, game engines are another area that are just there's so much there, and I think our industry is only scratching the surface uh, of what's possible. And I think that, yeah, I think once that really takes off, that's going to really change the way we do things. I think there's a big opportunity for for most of the software that we use to really merge with that and become much more real time, much richer with uh, with data and interactions and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that, that's probably the two areas where, where I see the, a lot of potential to push. Um, I also see a lot of value in, in tools that educate people as you use them. Uh, I didn't share our daylighting tool because it's not particularly exciting. It does things that daylighting tools do, uh, but it, it kind of lays out the basics. And as you go through it, I would say the designer is going to learn something. The, even the output sheet, you know, we put facts on there. We put talking points about if this is where you're at, these are the things you might want to consider and all that. And it's not rocket science. It's actually stuff you should learn early on in school. It's just stuff that people don't do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's um, really, really valuable. We've also been talking about rules of thumb and what is just, do you need a daylight analysis? Do, do you need to do it? If you're in certain zones within the space, you know, if you're on the south, you're going to get two times the head height of your window is how much daylight you're going to get for active daylight zone. Do you need to do an analysis to tell you that? Or can you just use that simple rule of thumb, which requires an offset? Uh, so I think there's, there's questions about what are we gaining from over analysis and where can we learn more from uh, tools that just apply simple rules of thumb and help designers to uh, understand the problem and the implications of how to apply uh, the results. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm curious to know like your definition of design innovation in AC, because I've seen like people integrating game technology in, in the firm and calling it innovation or like what what's your roles and responsibility and a, a day in your life? Um, so I, I would say mine, my purpose in the organization is not necessarily just about technology. Um, I would go, my, my purpose statement is to enable teams to inform designs with research and data in order to impact lives to increase human flourishing. So that's a, that's a mouthful, but it's something that I actually have written out. Um, and, and I go through quite frequently because it means a lot to me. Um, Again, it's talking about what am I doing, who am I connecting, and then what are the outcomes? And I think it comes back to, for, for me, it's increasing human flourishing, that idea of it's more, than, it's more than health. Wellness is more than health. Flourishing is more than just wellness. It's about connecting uh, your current emotions, your future emotions, your purpose, your meaning, all those kinds of things throughout your life, your accomplishments, 
And how can we do that, enable that through our work? And how do I help teams enable that through the work? So to me, innovation is around how do we come up with better ways to get to that end outcome where people have better lives? Um, so that, that to me is innovation. Does, does using SketchUp versus Rhino versus Revit, does that matter? No. Does a game engine matter? Not really. But the things we do with them, the way it helps designers to think, the way it helps designers to make connections, that's where we can get to the end piece. So it's, it's about, again, making everybody better, bringing better teams together, coming up with processes that connect the dots faster um, and more, you know, around more robust data. To me, that's where the opportunity to innovate is. Um, I don't think we're ever going to compete with technology firms. You know, we could, we could pour all of our money into it and we're never going to have enough money to, uh, to scratch the surface of what a Google is going to do with AI. If they decide they want to do it, they're going to do it and we'll just be left in the dust. Fine. Uh, I think we have a lot of other things that we can offer. And I think technology is a part of getting us there. And so for me, it's all about that end game. Uh, and what are the parts that we need to pull together to get our teams there? I see. So like process integration, workflow integration, and like use case. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I have a rapid fire round. So you'll get 10, 15 seconds to answer it. And okay. you've got to make it very brief. Okay. okay. Uh, which cities in your travel bucket list? Uh, I'd like to go to Columbus to see Ohio State play Nebraska in football. Interesting. Uh, any technical or business book which made a big impact in your life? Uh, the Culture Code by Daniel Coyle. Your role model? Jeez. Oh, Skip. Pass. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, your favorite movie? Um, oh, that's a good one. Uh, I love Jurassic Park, the uh, the original one. There's just so much magic. Uh, favorite restaurant? Um, I like tapas restaurants where you can go and get the small plates. So it doesn't really matter which one, but any of them. I just love that concept. Okay. And is like next question is like i'll ask bullish and bearish and you just like okay ai in ac uh, a little bearish metaverse in ac who unfortunately bullish i don't think it's a good idea but i think it's coming <laughs> uh generative design uh bullish blockchain and nft in ac I think it's coming, but I still think it's a long way out there. Cool. So a little bit bearish or a little bit bullish, sorry. Lastly, is there anything uh, you wish you would have done differently? Um, I wish I would have taken more real computer science classes in college. Um, I just feel like that my understanding is a little limited. Also more math classes. I wish I would have taken more college. I spent so long there. Now I just wish I had more of it. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Nate, for sharing your experience and such uh, amazing tools development. It was quite insightful. Absolutely. This was fun. I uh, really appreciate you reaching out and uh, inviting me on. Cool. Have a nice rest of your day, Nate. Yep, you too. Thanks, everybody, for watching.